The LCMS today is sadly a divided church body. Things that no one would have ever thought about doing in the 1950s and even the early 1960s are now happening on a broad basis throughout our Senate. Uh, we are divided in doctrine in several areas. We need to be honest with our own people. It's not really a question of style or personal preference, and it never has been. What breaks my heart is the fact that there are so many people in our Senate, apparently, uh, who, although they give lip service to who we are as Lutherans, uh, they don't really practice what they preach. We have a problem with integrity at this point. It's better for us to admit to disagreement than to pretend that it isn't there. Or if you're on vacation or a business trip and you walk into a Missouri Synod church, frankly, you have no idea what you're walking into and you can get everything from soup to nuts. There are serious divisions among us, not only in practice, uh, but sadly also in doctrine, which shapes practice. Right doctrine leads to right practice. Uh, you can't separate. Orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. You can't, you can't separate those. But the division is there. We see it in our worship practices. We see it in our uh, approach to missions. We see it in a number of avenues that gives indication that we are not all believing the same. It used to be that you didn't really see these things unless you experienced them firsthand by going to a, a committee meeting or a, a, a synod convention or a district convention or something like that. But now you can, you can see these divisions simply by getting in your car on Sunday morning and driving to uh, perhaps a church that's, uh, that's nearby where you live. Our synod is divided. Division divided. 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 Artistic worship if you're not actually in a worship service. He had the permission of his ecclesiastical supervisor. When President Bowman made it his goal to remove Robert Preuss from the presidency of the Fort Wayne Seminary, is a sad chapter in our synod's history. It appears that the students and professors of the St. Louis Seminary are forming a processional line. I think they're leaving. In 1945, there was a statement released by 44 rather well-known theologians within the Synod, and it became known simply as the Statement of the 44. And now we have this manifesto that basically states that we don't have to have complete agreement in the details of our doctrine to have fellowship together. And unfortunately, instead of standing firm, they instead said, tell you what, let's just take your theses off the table, your, your statements of affirmation off the table, and instead, we'll ask the same questions, but it'll come from the Presidium at the Synod. And we'll make sure that everybody in the Synod studies all of these issues that you've raised. Perhaps even with good intention in entertaining the idea of discussing these things did give a platform for error in the church. And, and basically what happened is these 44 men were allowed to simply fade into the background. They never were required to recant. They never were required to withdraw their statements. There was an underlying uh, influence that had come into the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod that was there in American Lutheranism even before. And that is that we cannot expect in this life that the church can hold the full truth and the totality of everything that God reveals in Holy Scripture. There seemed to be such a, a reluctance on the part of the church to actually deal with the errors that these men were putting forth as Lutheran doctrine. Well, what does that mean? It means we're not going to resolve the issue, but rather we're going to give what we already knew was false teaching a synod-wide stage with which to promote the error and without a clear rebuke, and without a corresponding church discipline, those errors 
have, not, uh, have now taken root in the Missouri Synod. Quite frankly, that led directly to the Battle of the Bible, as we know it, in the 1970s and the Seminex walkout, because the goal of the Seminex faculty was precisely the same thing as that of the Statement of the 44. And that was they really wanted to take the Missouri Synod out of its ghetto of just being our little group and cross denominational lines. And so that allowed us to look at the doctrine of other churches and say, well, you know, we may be different, but it's really not divisive. You know, the real sticking point was that they were teaching historical criticism at the St. Louis Seminary. Well, the historical critical method of biblical interpretation had allowed, allowed the interpreters to, to basically uh, set their own standards for what the scripture says. The, uh, the proponents of the higher critical method actually maintained that this method of studying scripture was entirely neutral. Anytime you're using a system of biblical interpretation, which will allow you to dance around what the scriptures actually say and enable them to say something other than they actually said, you've got a system that is not neutral. They, they looked at, at the Bible as something no different from any other document that's ever been produced. Another book, uh, another book which contained the word of God or uh, contained words about God, but was not defined as being the very Word of God. The historical critical method raised questions about the veracity of the scriptures, whether Adam and Eve were you know, real historical individuals, whether Jonah was actually swallowed by a great fish. And if you start raising questions about whether those things are true or not, what keeps you from raising questions about the veracity of Jesus himself and all the things he says? And what about the veracity of the resurrection itself? Well, you know, when you do away with the authoritative scriptures, it's just a matter of time before you do away with the confessions that are drawn from those scriptures. And so really you can draw a straight line from Seminex to this disdain that we have in the LCMS now for pure doctrine. And it's to the point now where a synodical president can publicly belittle pure doctrine and the synod goes on like nothing happened. But it wasn't always this way in the LCMS. When the old Lutherans came over to this country, we began to have a concerted voice of old Lutheranism in the United States that had not existed prior to that time at all. With the formation of the LCMS in 1847, you had in America for the first time a confessional Lutheran church body that was truly and completely united in doctrine and practice. What caused that unity in the Missouri Synod wasn't the fact that we all felt close to one another, but due to the fact that we were all believing and teaching and confessing and practicing the same thing. They studied everything about life and faith through the Word of God and the confessions of a church. That was what brought us together. It was their incessant doctrinal purification that kept them unified as a synod. That was, they were willing to discuss doctrine over and over and over again in the light of scripture and the confessions. And that was the hallmark of it. And we're not talking about just a two or three year period, but for almost a century where we were totally united in our doctrine and practice from one end of the synod to the other. There's a very interesting uh, remark by Richard Lenski, R.C.H. Lenski, the, Commentator, interestingly enough, a man from the General Council. And he wrote of the Missouri Synod, these people are unified precisely because they listen to the Word of God and they study it diligently. And we were not afraid to talk to one another doctrinally, to even uh, rebuke one another when we needed to be rebuked, so that we can also come to exhort those back to a right understanding. It is true that, that from the very beginning, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod did ha had a remarkable unity in doctrine and practice. And yet, if you go back even to the beginning, you see, you see things. For example, there was the predestinarian controversy. There was the Stephanite controversy to begin with. There was the conflict between the Buffalo Synod and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and the Iowa Synod. And there was the Keliastic controversy. All of those controversies were resolved primarily at the synodical conventions. It was very interesting what happened, and it was primarily due to the leadership of CFW Walther.
He would develop strong theses based on scripture and the confessions. He would present the case. They would resolve that issue on the spot. And I remember uh, an old pastor in my first circuit in Minnesota who told me about district conventions that he had attended when he was a young pastor. And if at any time someone would raise from the floor, or would make a statement from the floor, something which was clearly and evidently contrary to the doctrine and practice of the church, they would actually stop the convention and immediately deal with those issues. Um, I, we don't see anything like that today. I'm not talking about going back and suddenly living in the 19th century. What I am saying is that what we need to touch base with in our own past is that which made us Lutheran. And that was our doctrine and practice and the unity that we had and the attitude that we strive for the greatest possible degree of uniformity in what we do. Uh, we simply have to go back to our roots. We have simply have to go back to who we have always been. And I think when we do that, then, uh, then we'll be a much more, uh, a much more peaceful, uh, peaceful church body. I have actually heard it in Lutheran circles that pure doctrine is offensive. And I, when I hear it, I blink and I, I step back, at least emotionally, and I say, what? How can this happen? Purity of doctrine is what the Christian faith is. There is one truth about every point of Christian doctrine. It is never multiple choice. It is never, you can believe that or you can believe that, and as long as it's okay for you, it's okay for me. That is such an end the very antithesis of what the Christian faith is. Pure doctrine is relishing the gift that God has given to us, and we shouldn't be ashamed of having the, the pure doctrine. What we have allowed to happen in the Missouri Synod is when variances of, of understanding arose in the history and context of our church, that we began to study issues that we had already at one time clearly understood. And by studying them again and again and again, a process developed in which we began to believe that maybe doctrine wasn't settled in our church. And so at the end of all the studying, we don't really resolve anything. We just talk our problems to death. And slowly, incrementally, until we get to an answer that everybody's happy with, we keep studying it and studying it and studying it until finally we cave and we say, okay, we'll just let this be. We'll not resolve it. We'll just say everybody's position here is okay. If we're gonna be united under scriptures and the Lutheran confessions again, we are going to have to critically analyze our doctrine and practice, and we're gonna to have to get to the point where we can draw firm conclusions. We're gonna to have to abandon this, this postmodern nonsense that A and B can be correct at the same time, even if they're contradictory. And we have to say, well, it's either A or it's B. We need to have agreement in all articles of doctrine. And if we don't, then it all falls apart. As confessional Lutherans, we can never be comfortable. We can never be comfortable that we have arrived, that we have achieved some sort of doctrinal purity or doctrinal status. Satan, the world, and our own sinful flesh are constantly at war, constantly at battle, trying to tear down Christ, Christ's word, and Christ Church. And so we can never be comfortable. There is always a battle going on. Pure doctrine is essential for our church. It is the lifeblood, and it really will invigorate the church rather than tear it apart. If you want to define church fellowship, I think you have to say that church fellowship is altar fellowship. If you are in doctrinal agreement, then you are welcome at the altar. It was a, uh, a few months ago in one of our circuit winkles when one of the new pastors in our area with regard to the topic of communion and communion practices simply said, 
Why can't we as a circuit all agree on a common communion statement? Why can't we all start with the same page? Why can't we all have that same thing? Uh, I think there's something on the LCMS website. Maybe we could start there. And one of the other brothers in the circuit says, ha, 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 you know that'll never happen. And the other pastor, the young pastor, the new pastor that had asked the question, with tears in his eyes, said, no, I don't. I don't understand. If we all believe the same thing, why can't we have a common communion statement? It was at that point in time that everybody gathered around the table knew what the issue was. The issue was not a communion statement. The issue was, we don't all believe the same thing with regard to the doctrine and practice of the Lord's Supper. Some churches have a statement about communion in their bulletin, but according to these statements, if they're too general, anybody could come up to the altar for communion. Could a Roman Catholic read this and still commune? Could a Methodist read this and still commune? Could a Baptist read this and still commune? There are congregations I've been at who simply have no communion announcement whatsoever, either verbal or in the bulletin. If a church has no statement at all, then it's automatically open communion. So it's completely left to anyone who is visiting to determine whether or not they ought to go. There's no pastoral care in those situations when it's only left to a person's own conscience to decide. It's very clear in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 that it is quite possible for people to commune to their own judgment. We should practice closed communion because the eternal welfare of the people at our, uh, at our altar are at stake. I don't want to be, as a pastor, so unloving that I would aid and abet in someone coming to that altar and drawing on themselves, rather than the blessing of God, the condemnation of God. People don't like it. Quite frankly, uh, I don't like it either, as, a, as my old Adam uh, looks at it, because I can't commune my mother, I can't commune my father, I can't commune a lot of my own relatives. As, as a pastor over the years, I've had a few people who have come up to me highly offended that they were not welcome at our communion rail. And I tried to explain to them in the, in the nicest possible way why we do what we do. Usually the response I get from people is something along the lines about, well, my communing and what I believe is between me and God. We aren't judging people's personal faith when we don't commune them. What we are saying is the Lord has his table and he wants all people to come near, but always on his terms. And so I try to help them understand that when you kneel at the altar, you are one with Christ. He is giving you his very body and blood in with and under the bread and wine. And not only that, but you are also one with those with whom you are commuting. It's not just about you and Jesus. It's about all of us. Unity is a reflection of the very God who created us, the very Trinity itself. And his church is to reflect that unity in belief, in practice, and especially in our coming together in the great sacrament of the altar. Can we in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, be honest enough to say, we don't believe the same thing? Worship is, first and foremost, the Lord bringing His people near on His terms. The importance of worship is absolutely central and is that from which everything else flows in the life of the church. Lutherans have a very distinct way of worshiping. We keep the gospel and justification the main thing. We keep the form and content of the worship that which delivers Christ to us. It is not about our decision for Jesus. It's Christ's decision for us through the preaching of the gospel. The reality is worship doesn't belong to the worshipers. Worship belongs to God. It's His word, not our word. His sacraments, not our sacraments. We don't mess with God's word and sacraments 
in any way we please. Therefore, as Lutherans, we have a liturgical history. We have a liturgical worship, a way of coming together before God in which God imparts His gifts to us so that then being made alive by those gifts, we can return to Him proper thanksgiving and praise. This isn't entertainment. This isn't a fun time. This isn't what we get when we go to the movie theater or the sports arena. This isn't what's going on in my living room. This is heaven intersecting with earth. This is eternity punching into time and bringing me out of the mundane into the holy. Our worship should reflect the nature of the God that we do worship. And what is he like? He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is there divergence of opinion between the three persons and the Godhead, or is there divergence of will between them? Uh, well, absolutely not. In fact, it's, it's unthinkable. And our worship needs to express that same oneness of the God that we're worshiping. When you import the music and especially the words from another uh, church confession of faith, you're bringing that confession right along with it. How we worship is a confession of what we believe. Baptists worship like Baptists. If we begin to worship like evangelicals, we're going to also begin to believe like them. Methodists worship like Methodists. When we find others beginning to worship like Baptists or other or the evangelicals or Pentecostals or, or whatever denomination is out there that has a different understanding of the gospel, we find that those different gospel influences are also starting to happen in our own fellowship. Pentecostals worship like Pentecostals. As one scholar recently noted, uh, he asked the question, why do some Lutherans worship like Pentecostals? And his conclusion was they worship like Pentecostals because they are believing what Pentecostals believe. Lutherans worship like Lutherans. We worship in a way that, that lives and conveys what we believe, teach, and confess as Lutheran Christians. The state of worship in the Missouri Synod today is all over the place. To say that there's a variety is, I think, a gross understatement. So what we have done is we have opened the door and paved the way in the name of outreach and evangelism, in the name of being relevant, we have opened the door for people to leave the Lutheran Church. I don't want to suggest that the people who are making changes to the church's life together are doing that knowingly with evil intent, but they are scattering the church. There's a reason the first constitution of this synod said that we would strive, especially with respect to worship forms, for the greatest possible degree of uniformity. And all of a sudden we've backed away from that and said, no, no, what we want to have is more diversity. Well, diversity is the model of the world. Unity is the model of the church. Uh, some people have said that it's, it's wrong to like impose our will on other people. We're not imposing our will on anybody. We're simply asking that for the sake of charity, that we all join together as one, that we all do the same thing, say the same thing. That's what confessing means, to say the same thing. That's all we're asking. Uh, first of all, uh, definitions. What is unionism? Unionism is worshiping together with other fellow Christians with whom we are not in doctrinal agreement. We worship together and do work together as if there was no difference between our, uh, our core beliefs. The word unionism is particularly Lutheran because it is born from the Prussian Union that many of our Lutheran forefathers had to endure in Germany where the leaders of that day forced Lutherans against Scripture, against the Lutheran confessions, and against their conscience to use worship forms that did not extol the gifts of God, to use worship forms that violated their conscience, and more importantly, violated Scripture, because they denied baptismal regeneration. They denied the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper, denied the power of God's Word to actually forgive sins. Many of our forefathers left Germany, left Europe to come to a place where they could worship in freedom, where they would not be forced into any kind of a religious union. What our forefathers were forced to do years ago and fled from for the sake of the gospel 
many among us today run to. Syncretism is essentially the same thing, only it's a little broader, because there you're worshiping with people who are non-Christians in the same context. Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Jews all get together on the same platform or same stage, uh, giving the impression that we're all praying to the same God. That would be syncretism. And the problem is, of course, you're putting falsehood right alongside truth and offering them as though they are two viable alternatives from which to choose. On September 11th, this country was tragically attacked by vicious Islamic terrorists. Uh, almost 3,000 people perished that day. It was a day that shook us to our foundations. The Missouri Synod response was initially a very good one. Uh, I remember President Kishnek ran a full-page ad in the New York Times that was exceptional in offering comfort and consolation in the, in the face of uh, the tragedy. What happened following that wasn't so good. What happened was Mayor Giuliani called a, for a, an interfaith worship service, and I'm using his words exactly, from the memo that he sent out that in fact there was going to be Christians, there are going to be Jews, there's going to be Muslims and others from various denominations who would be present and who would be engaged in this worship service. President Banky decided he wanted to participate in that. And what transpired was, on international television, Jews, Hindus, danger. Christians Pray of all varieties, also Sikhs, and a number of other kinds of religious bodies were all together placing before not only the people in Yankee Stadium, not only the people in the United States, but the people of the world. It was internationally broadcast truth and falsehood alongside each other. Oh, we're stronger now than we were an hour ago. And you know, my sisters and brothers, we're not nearly as strong as we're going to be. And the strength we have is the power of love. And the power of love you have received is from God, for God is love. So take the hand of one next to you now and join me in prayer on this field of dreams turned into God's house of prayer. Our Constitution is real clear. It says as a condition God, for maintaining today, membership in the Synod, you, you must renounce strength, unionism and syncretism of every you, description. You if Yankee Stadium was not unionism and syncretism, I cr quite frankly don't know what would qualify. It was a blatant violation love, of that Constitution and the scriptures that it was, Jesus, it was echoing. Amen. There really was no resolution to the Yankee Stadium fiasco. Now, there's no repentance. And there's really no call for repentance from the Senate. And so this stuff goes on and on. What really the issue is in, uh, in our church body with regard to the role of women in the church is failing to listen to what God's Word says and then curbing, adjusting, conforming our thoughts, our ideas, our emotions, and our practices to God's Word. You know, I, I do think in many respects we have let society dictate what the church will do. And it's an, it's an attitude of give them what they want, not what they need. On the one hand, people want to be culturally sensitive. And in our culture, the raising of the whole feminist idea that everything is equal and everyone ought to be equally participating, even in the worship of the church, is, is very pronounced. It's been very difficult for people to really define what the issue is. Because so often uh, it's, it's coming from a rights perspective where someone says, I have the right to do this, or I am demanding the right to do that. And it's not a question of rights. It's a question of, of being God-pleasing. It's a question of, of doing what God has prescribed for the best order. So you get to 1969 when they finally said,
women suffered just fine. We took 100 years of our doctrine and practice, and in 1969, we said, this is no longer what God says, and we changed our doctrine. When we did that, we set in motion the forces of feminism within the church. And then, then that led to, in 2004, that, um, that they could be elders, that they could be presidents, and things of that nature. We do have churches with women elders. We do have churches with women presidents. We do have churches with women lectors. Really, what's next? What's next? We are, where are we going? Women's ordination? I think it's inevitable. When I think about the role of women in the church, I think one of the primary things that need to be addressed is the role of men in the church. When men put women into positions prescribed only for men by God, then women act contrary to God's will. It is not so much that women are, are stepping in where they shouldn't, although that's certainly true. It is more the problem that men are stepping aside from the responsibilities that God gave them. We need to address, perhaps even more vociferously, the matter of what the role of men is in the church and begin to do those things which God has asked men to do. Men need to step up. Men need to do what God has called them to do, to take care of their wives, to take care of the church. What does God's Word say about the role of men and the role of women? We in the Missouri Synod need to have the courage, particularly in this issue of women in the church, to go back to God's Word and listen to God, to do what God says. Each age its solemn task 
We don't have a good handle on the office of the ministry in the Missouri Synod, and that's the truth. We say we understand it, but in our actions, we confess that we don't. In 1989, the Synod Convention in Wichita passed a resolution that allowed for lay ministers to be trained and to preach and teach and administer the sacraments in LCMS churches. This isn't a power trip for pastors. It's simply saying, if we're going to be Lutheran and you want to be doing things in conformity with the Lutheran confessions as Lutherans, then maybe we ought to ordain pastors and send them to places where they need pastoral help. There are many times in our, in our church body where it seems like we want to take the easy out, where um, rather than get a pastor who may be a few miles or a few counties down the road, to, to come and to serve the people of God. We um, are quick, perhaps too quick, to call situations that are not an emergency an emergency, and to use that as an excuse to set aside God's word and do what we want to do. They are not pastors. And if a congregation is supposed to have a called pastor to proclaim the word and to administer the sacraments, then they should not be calling lay ministers they should, in fact, be calling a pastor. Now we have what we call a specific ministry program, which is supposed to be uh, allowing people in congregations in remote areas to uh, be trained theologically and then serve as pastors of uh, congregations that otherwise would not be able to have a pastor. What concerns me personally the most about the SMP program is that we are having men function as pastors with very, very little training. A specific ministry pastor is trained, but they don't take as many classes as the general ministry pastor does. These are people with great intentions. These are people with big hearts for the Lord. But the people of God deserve more. The people of God deserve more than good intentions. The people of God deserve pastors who are well-trained. Pastors need all the training that they can get, and the seminary is the perfect place to give that training to them. The office of the ministry is simply the office of Christ as he serves the church through his means of grace, through his word and sacraments. It's his office, not ours. We're not to deal with it in a merely pragmatic sense. The struggle goes on for us right here to be faithful and to follow Christ's word. And maybe we can examine what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. And if we have things backwards, to ask God for the gift of repentance and for Him to straighten things out among us. One of the uh, sad things that I've had an opportunity to witness as both a parish pastor and as a uh, regional vice president in the Nebraska district is the uh, shameful way that some pastors have been treated by their congregations. Now, there are times when, uh, when pastors have sinned and sinned egregiously and uh, need to be called to repentance, but that, that's not the issue that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a time when a, when a congregation decides that it wants its pastor to move on. Unfortunately, there are a lot of pastors that are being removed from their congregations, not for the biblical reasons, and only because they are being faithful to God's word. It could be that they are tired of him. It could be that there are some uh, perhaps personal mannerisms with their pastor that, uh, that they don't like. For insisting on the practice of closed communion, for instance. It may be a situation where people are living together outside of marriage. Uh, for insisting that they will not uh, allow contemporary worship in their congregation. It could simply be that they have itching ears and they're, they're looking for someone else or something else. When there's conflict there, there's all sorts of pressures that begin to mount. 
the worship attendance goes down and then the finances go down. I've seen it a number of times when a pastor has been uh, asked to resign. And many times it comes in the way, Pastor, we'd like to give you the opportunity to resign your call in exchange for a generous severance package. And all of this builds and the pressure builds and, and uh, a, a district president may be encouraging or suggesting uh, both to the man and to the congregation uh, that he had to consider resigning his call to that congregation. When a pastor has to go through that, it's not just him, it is his wife and his family that it suffers along with him. What I've seen all too often is that the pressure just mounts and the pastor finds himself in a crisis situation. He, he looks at his vocation as pastor, but also he may have the vocation of husband, father, and he sees what this pressure is doing to his marriage and to his family and to his own health. When pastors are encouraged to resign uh, for non-biblical reasons, we are asking them to break and to violate the 10th commandment, and we are not following the 10th commandment by encouraging them to stay and to do their duty. Because God's Word shows us that this is not merely an employee, not somebody that you hire and fire uh, at will, but it's the Lord who has called this man and put him uh, over this flock to be his servant there, to serve these particular people. And the Lord who puts the man there will be the one who determines when that man no longer serves that congregation. I would ask, what is the spiritual condition in Wittenberg today? I think anyone with a lick of sense would understand that it is a spiritual wilderness and that while they may have statues of Luther here and there, they really have none of his theology or very little of it. And that is sad, but it was Luther himself who said that the gospel is like a passing rainstorm. It rains with profundity here and there and passes on to other places. Where is it raining now? The Lord is going to have his people and he is not going to lose any of his elect. It's not up to me to make changes to the church in order to win the world. That's the Lord's business. And the spirit will work faith when and where he pleases in those who hear the gospel, not in those who get their felt needs met, not in those who get God on their terms or even the church on their terms. Our church body has a long, rich, and storied heritage with regard to mission, with regard to mission zeal. And sometimes people have sadly, wrongly, looked at a zeal for missions as the material principle, the thing that matters the most, the one true mark of the church. When a church grows in numbers, it feels good, but that is not a mark of the church. All of the sociological studies that show us that our society is becoming less and less spiritually oriented are simply telling us that our society is a problem. We are living in a more secular age. And that's all those sociological studies tell us. They are really not a good excuse for beating pastors over the head and saying they're not doing their job. Because if they're preaching the word of God rightly and administering the sacraments rightly, they are doing their job. They are feeding the sheep. When churches begin to cater to the wants and the preferences of the world in order to win the world, they're operating with a different model than that which is given by the scriptures, which is that the church is the city set on a hill, the light that shines in the darkness, the bride that is in the world but distinct from the world. And the Lord would have all people come to that, be part of that, but not on their terms, not by changing the church, but by the world coming into and being changed by the working of Christ within the church. People said, oh, you, you guys aren't interested in missions. You guys aren't interested in evangelism. 
I have no idea where that comes from because Lutherans are interested in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost. That is what we do. But it is not the responsibility of the congregation to give up everything else that they have as Lutherans in order to reach the lost. In other words, jettisoning the liturgy, jettisoning things that are unattractive to people who walk in our doors. We want to proclaim law and gospel, and we want the Holy Spirit then to work through a clear proclamation of the same. Our mission is to make disciples by means of preaching the Word of God in all of its truth and purity and administering the sacraments in accord with Christ's institution, feeding our sheep who in turn have divinely appointed vocations that God has given them in which they give witness to their faith in their own places where they already have existing credible relationships. That certainly was the New Testament model for growing the church. Well, when we talk about ecclesiastical supervision in the LCMS, we, we really have two separate issues. And the first is that uh, there is a kind of institutional tyranny that's crept into the LCMS where, for example, a district president will overstep the authority of his office and he'll come in and uh, uh, kind of uh, run roughshod over a congregation. And that really shouldn't be happening, and, and that is a real issue. Uh, but I think the bigger issue is that there is a kind of ecclesiastical supervision that is good and God-pleasing that ought to be happening that really is crucial to the life of the church. And that kind of ecclesiastical supervision uh, over doctrine and practice of congregations and pastors, that, that really isn't happening at all in a lot of cases. Ecclesiastical supervision within a church body, such as the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, is really about membership supervision. Membership supervision means you're there looking at the conditions for obtaining and maintaining membership in our synod. They're spelled out pretty clearly for us in the constitution of our synod. And to the extent that they are being adhered to, the church is healthy. Of course, the problem is that the mechanism for proper ecclesiastical supervision in the LCMS is just dysfunctional at this point. I mean, it's, it's not working, it's not supervising. I think when a district president is, uh, is overseeing the doctrine of his district, which is his responsibility, I think when, when things are allowed to continue, which are clearly contrary to what we have historically believed and taught and confessed, I think it gives a very bad image to our church body and uh, it leaves a lot of people scratching their heads and wondering how this kind of stuff can continue. So the CCM issued a ruling a few years ago that said that uh, no one could be disciplined for something that he did under the counsel and approval of his ecclesiastical supervisor. And so now this great unimpeachable defense for anything that anybody wants to do is, hey, I was just following orders. That means that we rely upon the authority of a supervisor and not the Word of God. Again, we're back to the problem of the toleration of error. For many district presidents, it's just more trouble than it's worth to confront error. I'm afraid the same old story that an awful lot of us would just simply prefer to not deal with confrontation. And so we don't. True ecclesiastical supervision ultimately lies with the pastors and congregations of this synod. And when the synod fails to exercise its responsibility and duty by human institution, the ecclesiastical supervision of a church, then those of us who by divine institution hold those keys have no choice but to obey God rather than men. 
I have no desire, nor does anybody else in the ACELC, to be an ecclesiastical supervisor of anyone else. We have procedures in place for that to happen, and that's the responsibility of the Senate President, the District President, and the Circuit Counselors. We simply want them to do their job. If it isn't done, we'll lose our Senate, plain and simple. The dispute resolution process, something that came about during the Bowman administration, it was an adaption of a business model which sought, rather than to bring about a win-lose situation, to rather try to achieve a win-win situation whenever possible. The problem is, of course, when you're talking about matters of doctrine and practice, you cannot always have a win-win situation. You cannot have falsehood and truth and say both sides win. It never seems to be a situation where we try to get to the bottom of the problem. We try to, to, to solve the theological issues and most of the time the issues are theological and we just simply allow the thing to be handled administratively. The system that was in place in the Missouri Synod prior to the dispute resolution process was one that was based on actually sitting down with the complainants, hearing the evidence, and making a judgment. It had a couple of levels of appeal that could be made, but then that was it. They were charged to make their, to make those decisions that were dealing with theological problems theologically rather than institutionally. It wasn't perfect. We used to have a dispute resolution process in our synod that was expensive, cumbersome, but maybe it worked. Now we have something that is less cumbersome, it is not as expensive, but it probably doesn't work. But it could have been fixed, but instead what we did is we threw out the entire system and brought in another system that works even less well than the original. To be really honest, the new dispute resolution process gives more authority to bylaws than to scripture and the confessions. First of all, I think uh, if we are to really fix the dispute resolution process, we need to get back to a foundation which makes judgments based on the scriptures and the Lutheran confessions. I think that's what Lutherans do. In August of uh, 2009, is when the, when the first meeting that we had was held. It was a group of about nine of us, and we uh, began to think and to plan and to put things together. And so we started asking people about um, um, if they thought this was an idea that was workable. We had identified 10 errors. We had a group of people that were uh, boldly willing to put their name on a letter, and we would send it out to congregations, not just pastors only, but uh, to congregations, because the problems we have are not just pastor problems. They're, they're problems for the entire church, pastor and people together. Why is it that some people are so upset by the existence of the ACELC? Uh, we have asked many times for people to tell us what is wrong with what we are doing. And rather than getting any response to that, what we get is, who do you think you are? Why have you done this? Okay, so here's one thing. I was actually taken a task by one of my brother pastors because he thought that my participation in the ACELC meant that somehow I was trying to insinuate myself as his ecclesiastical supervisor. We are not trying to be an ecclesiastical supervisor of anyone, but we are trying to be more than Aaron standing by watching Moses strike the rock. God's word is clear, we are our brother's keeper. We are trying to be faithful Christian brothers and sisters and speaking to those who are throwing not just our heritage, but the very centrality of the gospel aside. Another thing people are saying is, you know, the ACELC is not following the synodical processes that we've agreed to that are outlined in the bylaws. You need to realize that some of the errors that we have identified are the process itself. Uh, sometimes it's bylaws and resolutions that speak to the matter rather than the Word of God and uh, the Lutheran Confession.
And so where we in good conscience can work through the process, we have. And we have filed three official dissents with the CTCR. Some people have suggested that, that all this is is a thinly veiled effort to start a new synod. If that was our intention, we would have done that immediately. We could have done that very, very easily and avoided a lot of the criticism. We would just simply say, a pox in your house, and go away. We are part of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We love our church body. For many of us, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is our mother. This is where we were brought to the faith. Uh, and we love the church body dearly. What we're trying to do is to say, let's reform our synod. Let's bring our synod back to the orthodoxy it once was. And so rather than run, as some have done, um, we have decided that we would, uh, we would rather fight than switch. And we would rather call for repentance and call for reform within our church body. Some have suggested that the existence of the ACELC is really a vote of no confidence in the leadership of President Harrison. Several of our uh, brothers in faith have, uh, have not supported us as we, uh, we thought that they, uh, that they would and uh, certainly could. Some of the reason for that has been, well, you know, we have a new synodical president. We have a wonderful confessional man who's elected synodical president in Matt Harrison. And now that Matt Harrison is elected, all the problems are going to go away. You know, one man did not get us into this mess, and certainly one man is not going to be getting us out of this mess. He needs the ground swell support of people throughout the Senate, pastors and laymen, who are going to say, we want to be Lutheran. We do have a, a, a brilliant theologian and a, a, a great churchman as our synodical president. A one man. One man. He is one man. I, I think a lot of people have forgotten that in, uh, in Matt Harrison's paper, It's Time. He published prior to his election. He called for the very thing that uh, the ACLC is doing. It seems to me that the association is, is really very much in line with, uh, with his desire for uh, this, these discussions to take place at the grassroots level. That's exactly what this association is. We, uh, we have answered the call that Matt Harrison put out for a grassroots efforts of people to identify errors and to come together with solutions to the problems uh, rather than just uh, sit back and, and complain. The thing I hear more often than anything else is that the ACELC is dividing the Senate. That is just patently false. All we have done is point to the divisions and because we have pointed to the divisions then we're accused of causing them. But our intent is not to divide but to reveal the very fact that we're already divided. The ones who have divided this synod, which was an orthodox synod, are those who have been adapting uh, and adopting to heterodox uh, practices, which is also breeding in to the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, the heterodox doctrines upon which they're based. We are permitting error to remain unchecked, unrepented of, and that is fundamentally the definition of the lack of love. All the ACELC is doing is asking the Synod to take a good look at its doctrine and practice and, and, and uh, desiring only that as a church body we would be faithful to that which we've been given in the scriptures and the confessions. You, know, you don't have to just listen to hearsay about the ACELC. Instead, go to the ACELC website. Look at the conference papers that are there. Look at the conference sermons. Look at the teaching materials. Look at the fraternal admonition and, and read it. If you've already read it, read it again. And look at what the people in the association are actually doing and saying. That's how you know the character of the association. Why an association of congregations? That's probably been one point where we've been criticized um, the most, and yet I think it's the most essential thing that we've done. And many of the lay people, many of the folks in the pews, simply did not realize the extent of the issues that were going on in our church body. Uh, we needed to have an organization of congregations because congregations are more difficult to enroll in a, in a, in a cause like that, but at the same time they're a voice that's much more difficult to ignore because we speak collectively. 
Many of the reform movements in the past have been clergy only reform movements. If you're just going to be yet another uh, small group of individuals who are just going to be doing the same thing that small groups of individuals have been doing in our synod for years and years and years, obviously that has not worked. One of the hallowed traditions of, of, of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, I think, is the, the privilege that, that pastors and their congregations have of, of discussing theological issues with their peers, with other pastors and other congregations. It seems just natural. As a layman, I love reading about our history and how uh, our Lutheran reformers were so bold and brave, risking their very lives to uh, protect this confession. And in America today, we're so careless with, with what we've been given, what we've inherited. If error is not dealt with, it continues to fester and grow. It is loving to address error in the church. Uh, it's unloving to let it go and to uh, put souls in danger. And of course, the, the, the longer you uh, allow the error to, to run rampant and unopposed, then, then the more souls are lost and we're not doing our job. We want pastors to step up. We want them to lead us, to teach us. We want to be Lutheran. We want our children to be Lutheran. It does make me angry that we're not dealing with the issues because when I grow up, I might not have a church to go to. I recall reading somewhere once where Dr. Herman Sasse said that the first act of the church always is repentance. Uh, and um, uh, there is no better advice for us now or for us ever. This is what sets us apart, that we are willing to speak the truth in love, not for the condemnation of our brother, but for the life and salvation of our brother. Don't say we're just going to agree to disagree. If I am not in line with the scripture and the confessions, then love me enough to call me to repentance. What we want is to have unity in what we believe and teach and confess. We want to have that unity outwardly. We want to have it inwardly. We want to joyfully embrace one another in Christ, recognizing one another as brothers and sisters, and we want to move on with the mission of the church to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's always the right time to address issues of doctrine and practice. Too many people in our synod pastors and laity alike who, for the sake of comfort, are content to simply sit in their congregations and say, we'll be faithful here, we won't worry about the rest of the Senate. And by standing on the sideline and being silent, they are contributing to this process very little. My friends, our Synod is really at stake here. Are we going to begin to address our issues as theologians throughout the Senate, including our lay people? Or are we going to simply sit back and deal with things institutionally? To those congregations who want to be more Lutheran than they are, and I'm not sure what, what to do about that, uh, I would suggest that the ACLC is a good place to go, actually. To my brethren in the ministry who will, will say, yes, I, I'm with you on these matters, but, but I'm, I'm not sure whether it's time to to involve myself and my congregation. This really is time for you to get involved. And uh, at least for now, at least you get involved. And then in, in good time, bring your congregation along as well as you can. I believe that this time has been given to us and we have been given to it. It's our time to stand and confess. It's our time to fight once again for the orthodoxy of the church. So we have that same thing to pass on to the future generations. I'm part of the ACELC because I'm concerned for those with whom I am in fellowship, that we are no longer walking together. I owe that to my brothers and sisters in this synod to speak the truth in love. If people are willing to listen, if people are willing to study God's word on a topic, there is hope. There is hope because God's word will do its work and God's word will have its way with people. These are issues that have been around for a couple of generations at least, if not longer. Um, they need to be addressed. And uh, if not now, when? Well.